uh, CRL is, as many of you know, a um, consortium of over 200 North American research libraries, independent research libraries, academic research libraries, and uh, academic libraries in general. We, we have been um, in operation since 1949. And uh, we do very different things today than we did in 1949, but the thing that we have done since, did in 1949 and are still doing is uh, to bring together the, the energies, expertise, and resources of the research library community to ensure the integrity and long-term availability of critical sources for research, and be, those, be that research, humanities research, social sciences, uh, scientific research and um, and public policy research. One of the um, collections that CRL was instrumental in uh, preserving was the um, transcripts. A couple of years ago, the Attorney General of Brazil visited CRL and um, told us that a collection that the Latin Americanist um, Area Studies Project working under the CRL auspices had preserved back in the 1970s and 80s was the transcripts of the secret military trials that were held in Brazil in the late 1960s and 1970s at which, um, which tried and um, resulted in the executions and disappearance of thousands of Brazilian citizens. Uh, it turned out that the copy of that, those materials, the microfilm copy of those materials, um, at Sierra was the only copy known at the time. So those materials are now, all 850,000 pages of those are now up on the open web. Um, by with the Brazilian government put them up on the open web and now they're being used as the basis for reconciliation, repatriation, and that kind of thing. So in a way, a center, it's in, in that way and in other ways, CRL has had a vested interest in government-produced documentation, government-produced information, and the workings of government since, since 1949. We, um, are a number of people helped put this program together. Uh, a number of them are in the room today. Uh, Scott Walker from DePaul University, Ingrid Parent from the University of British Columbia, um, James Jacobs from Stanford University, and Mary Case from the University of Illinois at Chicago. I think they're all in the room today. At any rate, they are, um, they're credited with helping pull together what I think is going to be a good program. Um, our first speaker is Thomas Blanton. Uh, Tom Blanton is the Executive Director of the National Security Archive, okay, which is based at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He's a leading advocate of government transparency and disclosure. Tom has been a leading a activist uh, or advocate of that since the 1970s. The National Security Archive, not to be confused with National Security Agency, has, uh, was founded in 1985 by journalists and scholars. Uh, and it has a distinguished record of research and advocacy that defends and expands public access to government information. In uh, 2000, the archive won the um, U.S. Journalism's George Polk Award, the prestigious George Polk Award for, um, as the Polk people put it, piercing the self-serving veils of government secrecy, guiding journalists in search of the truth, and informing us all. Please join me in welcoming Tom Blanton. <laughs> to be introduced by one of my real heroes is a, more than an honor and a real, a real pleasure. Um, but Bernie had such nice words for me. It, it, made me think of something Lyndon Johnson used to say when he'd get a really warm introduction like that. And he'd say, I wish my mama and my daddy could have been here to hear that. <laughs> Johnson would say, my mama would have really enjoyed it, and my daddy might have actually believed it. <laughs> but uh, more to the point, I guess, was when uh, Henry Kissinger was doing his shuttle diplomacy and a distinguished fellow approached him at an embassy gathering and said, Dr. Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger, thank you for saving the world. <laughs> Kissinger, never the loss for words, said, you're welcome. <laughs> CRL really is saving the world. <laughs> um, Bernie asked me to give a 
public policy perspective. And, and I just want to remark first on what an amazing program y'all have in front of you over these next couple of days and the extraordinary resources that are already online from CRL about this whole set of issues that are each panel has a has a huge amount to grapple with. But and I was most struck by I think in the James Jacobs paper, the sort there were bunches of things that just jumped out at me, but but in there was a quote, an estimate, an educated estimate, where Jacob says there are more born digital government information items produced in a single year now than all the non-digital items in the depository library system for 200 years. Wow. You wrap your head around that. And that's sort of what our challenge is and what we're here to do. I wish that I was speaking at the end of the program tomorrow because I would be significantly smarter by that point than I am right now. But what I want to give you is a bit of a public policy provocation rather than a, a perspective. And and I guess that's kind of the job of the speaker right after lunch. you got to be provocative enough to keep people awake, but not so provocative that you mess with the digestion, right? So this is, this is the task. But um, my working title today was Dispatches from the Big Data Trenches. And, and by that, signifying that there are real battle lines, and there are real battles, and there are real vested interests happening out there. They're not in favor of open government or opening big data. It's signifying um, some of the real, the issues of chronic crisis, if you think about World War I and trench warfare, the chronic crisis in electronic records for our federal government. Um, and kind of on the side, a little plug for my little non-governmental organization and all the digging that we do, and sometimes fortifying and sometimes actually winning a few. And really this struggle over the digital future and our, our history of and electronic records generally reminds me of this joke that Ronald Reagan used to tell Mikhail Gorbachev at the summits. Gorbachev hated this, by the way. But it was one of Reagan's favorites, and it was about the Soviet worker who so overachieved his quota time after time that finally the party decided that he should get an automobile. Miraculous. Incredible. The commissar sits down with the worker. They fill out the paperwork. The commissar says, okay, and you'll be getting delivery 25 years from now. Worker says, from today? Commissar says, yeah, 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 from today, 25 years. Worker says, morning or afternoon? <laughs> Commissar says, 25 years from now, what are you asking, morning or afternoon? Worker says, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> That's our crisis with electronic records. Because 25 years ago this month, I was in federal court against the President of the United States and, by the way, the National Archives of the United States, trying to force them to save the White House email 25 years ago. And last May, the National Archives finally put out some guidance, the capstone guidance we applauded loudly, saying to agencies, save your senior people's email electronically. You're going to have to do that. Unfortunately, the deadline's not until 2016. but. It's a step in the right direction about 25 years late. And this is what I mean by the chronic crisis. In the courtroom on the last day of Ronald Reagan's term in office in January 1989, we had found out that the National Archives had gone along with the White House in defining out of existence the email. They said, no, it's just telephone message slips. It's not records. We had hundreds of Oliver North's emails from the Iran-Contra investigations, hugely historic, covert operations all over the world being run by email. We went to the federal judge and said, come on, you can't let them get rid of all the backup tapes. Uh, we need an injunction. We need a restraining order. Now, on the other side of the courtroom was this uh, acting attorney general of the United States. He had one of those walrus mustaches, went on to fame and fortune at the United Nations, name of John Bolton. You've probably seen on Fox News every now and then, but on that day he was the last Reagan appointee standing at the Justice Department. And he says to the judge, you know what, we're just cleaning out the furniture, we're taking the pictures off the walls, we're making room for the new, um, for, for the new folks to come in, the new, new administration. 
And the judge was this interesting guy, Barrington Parker Jr., came up from the D.C. Superior Court and had some landlord-tenant disputes. He said, you know, I've heard landlords routinely clean out the apartment, but I rarely hear of a landlord piling it all up on the lawn and burning it. <laughs> we got our injunction. We got our restraining order. Created havoc at the White House. Created havoc at the archives. Nobody was ready to take possession. There were, you know, hard drives thrown into boxes. There were midnight rides. It was just a totally... It happened again, by the way, when George H.W. Bush left office. But getting a little ahead of my story, the point here is just simply that we had to sue not just President Reagan, George H.W. Bush, but President Clinton. People in the Clinton administration wanted to settle, wanted to put in the kind of capstone guidance. John Podesta, working for Clinton, said, we should do this, save the senior officials. Anybody who's a political appointee, let's do that. He was, he was overruled. Uh, people like George Stephanopoulos said, are you kidding? People going to be rummaging through my email? No way. We're not going to do that. They did create an archiving system at the, when the courts ruled against them unanimously. And to their credit, that archiving system stayed in place with glitches all the way up to the first two years of the George W. Bush administration. Then we had to sue the George W. Bush administration again because he choked that system, created some temporary ways to save email. Um, and ultimately, that lawsuit found or restored, depends on who you talk to, about 22 million messages from the year, the two years, that we invaded Iraq. But it took a whistleblower. Think about that. From inside the White House IT staff who told us, when you go back and look on specific days for email, why the vice president's office has 16 days where he's zero email sent or received. Does anybody in this room ever have a day where you have zero sent or received? I, know, I go away for two days and I come back and it's, you know, it's overloaded. GW is sending me messages. You're on, get your quota now, right? I mean, it doesn't happen. But it happened then because of a failure to address the real sets of issues. And to get to the big data piece of what we're trying to talk about, let me give you the metadata. So our little temporary restraining order saved they estimate about 250,000 individual email messages from the Reagan years, this is 1980s. Now on an item level, that's about as many as Chelsea Manning leaked to WikiLeaks of the diplomatic cables. That's, that's big data, actually. From the George H.W. Bush presidency, that number is around 400 to 450,000. This is 1989 to about 1990, beginning in 93. Clinton years, the 1990s, invention of the World Wide Web, we all go on email. What's the number? Some of the people in this room know the number. 32 million individual email messages. That's from the Clinton years. George W. Bush, we got to the end, got the restoration happening. The total number broke 200 million. And when we're sitting at the Obama White House in December 2009, settling the case with them, getting briefed on their full archiving system, including the president's own BlackBerry, first president to use, a portable device while in office. One of the staffers, a junior lawyer in White House counsel, obviously said, 200 million, George W. Bush did 200 million. Shoot, we'll probably do that in the first year. That's what you're talking about. That's, that's big data. But it, it's a, along the way were revelations. And I'll, I'll just tell one story about that, which because it, it goes to some of the themes that will come up over these two-day period. So in 19, the way we persuaded federal judges to save the email was by asking them for a random sample from people's user areas with names like Colin Powell. You take a look at it, Mr. Federal Judge. You tell me, is that a record or is that a message slip? Um, I published a whole selection of these samples that the judges ordered release in a book called White House Email in 1995. It was one of the first books that had a little pocket in the back with a floppy disk in the pocket. Right? Floppy disk in the pocket. More White House Email was the label of the disk, and you put it in your computer and you could see what it looked like on a White House computer. We thought it was terrific. My computer today doesn't have a floppy disk drive. I'm not sure you can load that thing anymore, right? This is one of our issues over time. And, but I'm getting, I'm missing my core story, which goes to something Matt Connolly's going to be talking about right after me, which is, so I published this great book. I get a phone call from the National Security Advisor, a guy named Tony Lake. He'd been on our board of directors when he was in academia, but now inside government, he ended up being the defendant in our White House email lawsuit, one of the defendants. But Tony's a pretty nice guy. He says, Tom, 
want to give you a book party. Come over to the Situation Room, meet some of the staff. Well, I go over, there's 20 copies of White House email. Now, the archive, National Security Archive, is getting about a dollar twenty-seven cents on each copy. So I'm thinking, well, that's enough to take somebody out to lunch, maybe. I'm signing it to staff. I'm, I'm telling Tony, what you, you're a great guy. Your commitment to open government. I really appreciate this. Tom, you got me all wrong. I'm giving this book to my staff so they never, ever write an email like this. Right? This is the warning. Don't do it. Don't do it. Shut down. Don't do it. He said, you know, you don't understand what this open government stuff is doing inside the government. He said, people aren't even write stuff down. I don't have a transcript of my briefings with President Clinton anymore, like Kissinger kept. He says, I go in with an index card, just with some bullet points. I come out. It's just impoverishing the historical record. And I said, Tony, it's not me. It takes me 10 to 20 years to get your stuff released through Freedom of Information. It's that guy Gingrich up in Congress is serving him with subpoenas and all that. He said, well, yeah, but, but still, this is terrible. But then I got some support. His staff director, wonderful person named Nancy Sutterberg, now the head of the Public Interest Declassification Board. Nancy's standing right there. She said, Tony, Tony, don't exaggerate. You come out of the Oval Office. You got your index card. You come over and stand next to me. You start dictating messages. I'm just typing furiously. We're sending out dozens of them. You go stand next to Sandy Berger. He sends out hundreds of messages. You do it to every senior person. Says, Any issue that came up with you and the president, you know, at the end of the day, there's probably 10 times more documentary evidence of what you and the president talked about than in any transcript or any Nixon tape. So don't go fooling anybody. This electronic revolution means there's far more to deal with than those White House email numbers, I think, you know, make that point. So the, you'll hear more about that and some of the barriers like just reflexive overclassification, spurious national security secrecy claims that Idiotic legal theories like the mosaic theory, which essentially means you can't think. You can't actually put two pieces together. It's like it allows securecrats actually to classify public data, this mosaic theory idea. Um, it, it's the opposite of a reasoned, rational, cost-benefit, what's the danger, what's the identifiable harm approach to national security information. But the, the point I want to make about the long, uh, the long trend line for White House email, and it's just the tip of the iceberg in its way. We've had two decades of not saving senior agency emails. We have millions of lost records at the most senior level of the United States government, and we're never actually going to be able to catch up with that. Um, and even when you get really good direction, and I'm just great policy decisions, like in August uh, 2012, when the, the Office of Management and Budget and, and one of my other heroes, David Ferriero, signed a directive that goes out to all the heads of agencies saying, you know guys, you gotta change how you're thinking here. You gotta manage all your electronic records electronically, but we're gonna give you to 2019. You gotta manage all your email electronically, both permanent and temporary, but we'll give you to 2016. And it's, and there's a fundamental reality, and that's what I want to get to with the, the provocation piece. Um, the White House has been managing its email electronically with some bumps in the road and some glitches and some missing and some need to restore, but since 1993. And really, the whole United States government should have done so. And the blockages to that were only partly, I think, resources. They were also mentalities. They were also, but this is the way we've already always done things. It's, it, it, it was hard to get over, I think, those those ones. And I just want to say, where there's a will or a federal judge, there's usually a way. And I don't want to be too critical because I'm a huge fan of the National Archives and Records Administration. I depend on incredibly terrific people who work there. I've worked in dozens of their reading rooms from Simi Valley to College Park. The National Security Archive, we couldn't do our work without the phenomenal professional access and efforts of the staff of the National Archives. But I just want to say the National Archives acts like an abused child. It's an orphan child in many respects. And, there, and it's just now, I think, coming out of what I would say on electronic records is sort of decades of, of those problems. If you look at the sort of bad news piece overall, you've got the flagship initiative, the Electronic Records Archive, is essentially a legacy system that's not even going to survive the end of this directive, the 2019 directive. It's just, it's not cable. It's got, in 2012, it had 131 terabytes. I'm sorry, that's a single collection system at the National Security Agency in a week. You know, it's just not even coming close to the dimensions of the problem. And 
I'm going to throw out a bad metaphor, but it, it's what the National Archives and Records Administration looks like to me today on electronic records. It looks like one of those home security systems you stopped paying the bill on years ago. You're basically dependent on the little sign in the front yard down by the sidewalk to deter the burglars. <laughs> Occasionally some bells go off because there's still some wires in there. You can pretend you got something and you got some security, but really we, the taxpayers, stopped paying the bill on the security system years ago. And that is this extraordinary problem. And it's not just, there were moments, the self-inflicted wound, I think, of the White House email was a huge problem. That was ducking the challenge at a moment when they had federal judges and the entire openness community behind a potential real step up to the battle. And but that would have meant changing even the sort of mindset of a whole agency. Um, there was another moment in the middle of the 1990s. I've spoken and testified about this before. It was a turning point for the National Archives. President Clinton orders massive declassification of the Cold War records. And at a similar moment, in the early 1970s, when Richard Nixon decided to release all the records of every Democratic president who preceded him, Roosevelt, Kennedy, Johnson, big mass declassification, the National Archives leadership sort of went to the president, went to the White House and said, you know, to do this, we're going to need a bunch more FTEs. We're going to need some resources. We're going to need more people. And they got a couple hundred more people in the 1970s. And those people went on to be the leaders at the career level of all the great things the National Archives has done over the years. But in 1994, 1995, when Clinton is doing this, we had an archivist who was a former governor of Kansas named John Carlin. I've had this argument with him, so I'm not saying anything behind his back. But he decided just to reinvent the people that he had and not ask for any new ones. And the net effect was to create a backlog that's still bedeviling the National Archives today. The stuff that Clinton ordered declassified still has not reached the shelves of the National Archives for researchers to use today, despite a lot of effort and a lot of heroic work by a lot of people, just because a huge, enormous research, resource gap by bad decisions and bad mindsets, even back in the mid-90s. And so, this week's Washington Post, I think on Tuesday, had a nice story where they said they're going to reopen the procurement contract for the new presidential helicopters, Marine One helicopters. It's one of my favorite examples. You know, Ralph Nader used to, used to always say, well, the cost of the Freedom of Information Act, whatever, 100, 200 million, is less than the cost of Army marching bands. You choose. What's more to say? Well, my favorite example is the Marine One helicopter, because the last time they tried to get new helicopters for the president, they finally had to cancel the contract because the unit cost per chopper broke $400 million. That's more than what OMB has just given the National Archives of the United States. One helicopter. Let's fly the damn thing to College Park already, okay? Seriously, this is, this is a huge issue, I think, for all of us, for the citizens of any persuasion. If you're doing a helicopter more than you're investing in your own history and your own future, your priorities are really few. So that's my kind of public policy provocation in many respects. I've got a couple of proposals to throw in. I know you're going to be dealing with a lot of other, I think, really vital issues. I think you're going to look over these next couple of days much more specifically at the role of research libraries, the changing role. I was just mentioning to Bernie that I just read a great article by Don Waters of Mellon Foundation where he, he says that essentially research libraries are on this trajectory from the collecting and preservation of special collections to a current era trying to deal with the electronic records challenges where we're turning into data curators but that our future is really going to be the kinds of interactive collaborations with lots of folks, scholars, engineers, crowdsourcing, to try to make sure the data is available on multiple platforms, for multiple users, for multiple purposes, but it's going to be a very different role than a static preserving role. I, I thought this was brilliant, it made a lot of sense to me, um, defines the challenge in an interesting sort of arc of professionalism. It's something I know we're going to face. I think that you're going to, over this next day or so, you're going to deal, here's a lot of the 
not just the dangers, but also the incredible opportunities and what big data can bring to all of us as citizens and consumers and scholars. Um, and I'm just thinking just in the, you know, what, two weeks ago, we got finally, after years of the American Medical Association refusing to let the government release it, the data on how much money individual doctors get for Medicare. And what we find out that the richest doctors in America, at least in Medicare, making $11 million a year, are what, cardiac surgeon, neurosurgeon? No, ophthalmologists. Ophthalmologists who choose to use the most expensive drug for eye treatment with the highest profit margin both for them and the pharmaceuticals. A good friend of Senator Menendez in, in Florida made $11 million from you and me, taxpayers, last year as an eye doctor because he used this particular drug. That's a big data breakthrough, right? That's going to bring some accountability, some better government decisions, some better consumer decisions, some pushback by insurance companies, you name it. That's what a year ago it was the hospital operating data. Two hospitals four blocks away from each other. One charged 49000 for the operation, the other charged 149000 for the operation. Wow. That's some of the miracles that you can get from big data because you're going to see pushback. I think it's one of the reasons and President Obama's pretty lucky on this, and healthcare costs have flattened over the last few years as big data has made it more and more possible for us and others and the forces in the marketplace to actually push back against what were opacities that were deliberate, right by the AMA, to create what the economists call information asymmetries, which is where the biggest opportunities for profit are. So there are some incredible opportunities, but let me get to my my finales, because I basically want to do what Deep Throat advised Bob Woodward to do, which is follow the money. And where's the money? Um, essentially, I would argue that the National Archives and Records Administration can no longer operate on the traditional archival role. It can't sit and wait for 30 years for an agency to hand over its records. Not not only because of my floppy disk problem, but because even in the most high quality of media migrations over time, you're going to lose some records. The most recent uh, kind of breakthrough posting, which you know our, we we made a lot of hay out of. I don't know that the National Archives even um, did a press release. Uh, should have, because it was a big deal. We've been waiting for it for four years. Um, there you go. Hundreds of thousands of diplomatic cables from 1977. You're going to see in Matt's presentation some analysis of the 1973 to 76 ones. Incredible gold in them there hills. Right? Extraordinary material for diplomatic historians. First year of the Carter administration. Bad things happening all over Latin America, like Bernie's example of Brazilians. Those are incredible material. And yet there are a couple thousand cables that went missing despite the best quality archival transitions, migration, credible attention by the State Department over time. You can look at that for yourself, but essentially, and this is not an original uh, point for me, I've testified about it from Congress, but I always cite the National Academy of Sciences study that, that I really stole this idea from, and, and I flog it, and I'm probably flogging it to death, and David and others have heard it too many times, but, you know, in my house, I have this little white gizmo that plugs into my Wi-Fi circuit and it shoots out, I can pick up my Wi-Fi all over the house. And any time I load a new file on this little Mac Air, it's not just I'm plugging Apple, I think there are a lot of other people who do this. Time Capsule actually backs it up. National Academy of Science has said the National Archives and Records Administration will fail to meet its mission unless, in the face of e-records, unless it becomes the off-site backup in real time for federal government record systems. That otherwise, you are in a perpetual legacy floppy disk situation indefinitely. And I think that's right. Getting from here to there, however, <laughs> is going to take, it's going to be a real stretch. I mean, in a way, what you're asking, here we have an entire archives profession that has spent 130 years developing the most excruciatingly ethical and moral standards for how to throw things away. Only 2% of what the government creates gets actually saved, ends up the National Archives. And what we're basically now telling the National Archives to do is read Soldier or Fortune magazine. 
You know, Soldier of Fortune magazine, the, the mercenary magazine, their motto over the masthead was, kill them all, let God sort them out. We're sort of saying, save them all. Let computers and algorithms and collaborations and curators sort them out. It would be far more efficient, particularly given the dramatically declining cost of computer storage. Save them all. We can sort them down the road. Don't spend four years after the, the diplomatic cables have been declassified. You don't have enough people to check it for privacy violations. The cables are full of social security numbers because people did visa applications. You can't get it out on, online where people can use it for four years because you're not resourced and you're doing stuff you should have been able to automate. And maybe we can do it down the road, but if you don't save them all now, you're going to lose most of it. So there is some help on the horizon. I'm not just a naysayer, a critic, and a provocateur. I think uh, if you follow the money, as we Joe said, there are two pots. One pot everybody's heard about from me, and that's the IT pot. Federal government spends 70, 80 billion dollars a year on IT services and equipment and the like. And, and I think the Managing Government Records Directive is a step in the direction of the National Archives rising to the level of taking that, its chunk, its fair share, its odin of that IT money on the front end to become real-time backup people so that the archiving challenge can actually be met down the road. But there's a second pot of money out there. Um, we know a lot more about it today because of a guy named Edward Snowden. We know the actual budgets of each of the intelligence agencies. And we know a lot more about the phenomenal electronic records management capabilities. These are folks who can scoop up the metadata on every phone call in America going back to 2003, preserve it in searchable, retrievable, pattern, uh, pattern recognition forms, and keep it essentially indefinitely. Well, as Obama's just told them, they can't keep it anymore. I think there's going to be a lot of unused capacity out there at Fort Meade. <laughs> I think we need to set up a little shuttle service, you know, College Park to Fort Meade. I think the National Security Agency should pay for its sins by taking on this challenge that matters to every citizen in America. They can do it. They can sweep up in an unnamed country, might be Pakistan, might not, might have just been a prototype, every phone call for a year, the actual content and save it in searchable formats. For intelligence analysts, use phenomenal, incredible. Boy, if the electronic records archive in the But National Security Agency, I think we've got some advocacy to do. I think that we should get the National Security Agency involved with this challenge of creating what the National Academy of Sciences defined as the off-site backup for all federal government information systems. Think about how nicely that also fits with their mission on cybersecurity. I mean, there's some real congruences here. I'm not just making this up, as uh, Rush Limbaugh says. So, but what will it take to get there? It'll take our consciousness raising, which is what Bernie is starting and what we're all doing over this next, uh, this next day or so. It'll take some advocacy, it'll take some coalition buildings, it'll take setting out some real targets and benchmarks, it'll take some real pressure, it's probably going to take some more lawsuits, it's definitely going to take some exposés on the crisis. I mean, there's nothing like a nice headline in the New York Times to get people's attention at the White House and elsewhere, and at OMB, which controls the budget. It's going to take a lot of work and all of our skills as curators and advocates. And in that struggle, I always remember what the Polish communist authorities always said about solidarity back in Sweden. When two of them got together, it was an illegal gathering. When three of them got together, it was an illegal demonstration. But when 10 million of them joined solidarity, a uh, handful of extremists. <laughs> I just want to say it's a pleasure and honor to be here with the extremists. Thank you.
Thanks, Tom. Really excellent start to the um, to the discussions. We do have a few minutes uh, for questions for Tom. I can't believe I didn't go over this. Sure. I'll, 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 I think there's a mic right there. I'll, I'll leave Okay, well, maybe yeah, there we go. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the role of contractors, like Lockheed had a $300 million contract with the National Archives that I don't think turned out all that well. And why is it hard for the uh, relationship between contractors and people in the National Archives to turn out well, or what has been hard about it? I don't know the in inside story, I just know the outside story. And the outside story is essentially, and they ultimately confessed to it, I think the Lockheed people, and the bottom line was they put their B team on it. And where was their A team? Probably collecting phone calls in Pakistan. I don't want to oversimplify, but I think that's the reality of, of what happened there. And there's a whole lot of fixing that, took, that had to take place. And I, and I think uh, part of that is simply a resource matter. If your total agency budget is $400 million and you go out to contractors and say, okay, we want you to come in and do something really big for us, how far are you going to get? Are you going to get the 18? No. If your agency budget is $16 billion, like the Fort Meade people, you might get more of the 18. Um, I think, though, it will really take the real clear direction, I think this Managing Records Directive was a great start, it's just I would move up the deadlines a little bit. I find deadlines, even if you don't meet them, they're, they're what was it, Samuel Johnson said, when I'm told I'm going to be hung tomorrow, it clarifies the mind, right? It's just, even if you push back, push it back, it's like setting an earlier deadline would actually make agencies move more. That's my view. I don't have a full answer for you, but I hope that gets partly it. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Jill Moriarty, University of Utah. Hello. Uh, I am rather skeptical that any security agency, let alone the National Security Archive agency, agency, sorry, would That's willingly give up their information rather than purging it. I mean, if they were to turn over what they've gathered, that is proof of what they've gathered. Right. How would you address that? I think on the metadata, let me separate that out into two parts, because one is the metadata and what they've gathered, and I think that's going to have to be purged because the president himself has gradually become convinced that, in fact, it was unconstitutional and illegal, despite it being blessed by 15 judges. I was suggesting a different dynamic, which is what the National Security Agency has done extraordinarily well is records management of whatever it was. Much of it totally legitimate intelligence collection that protects you and me from terrorist threats. What I'm saying is that's where the money is. That's where the expertise is. They're renowned at Fort Meade for hiring more mathematician PhDs, right, than anybody else. So let's see if we can get some direction, get some OMB leverage behind it, get some challenge behind it. I think it will take something like the connection to the cybersecurity mission, which is the other part of the National Security Agency's mission, that part of what they got to do is ensure the security of government databases against hackers and Belarusians and little green men and stuff like that. And that might be what it takes to get over the hump. I just think that right now the National Security Agency and most of the intelligence community in general is pretty abashed. And, and embarrassed. I mean, James Clapper looks into the camera and lies directly, and then he asks them, and he asks him, why you, what, what were you thinking? He said, well, I was trying to be as least untruthful as possible. You know, my 15-year-old tries that with me, you know, and it doesn't go very far, but the director of national intelligence apparently has gotten away with it, sort of. But it's a great time to tell them they have some civic duties other than just collecting all of our metadata, and it connects to one of their key missions. And I think it's their it's the technological prowess that we need to figure out advocacy ways. I'll be talking to people at the White House and saying, you ought to be thinking about this. And they got to, you know, pay for their sins. And here's a good way to do it. It it's, might be pie in the sky, but I've argued for more pie in the sky things than seeing them happen. So. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great. Thank you.